we had phone meetings and meetings for smaller groups in between the big meetings, which are three times a year. Sorry, I hadn't turned this one on. This was the famous Mr. Scam Lightly. Ah. <laughs> he calls me sometimes too. Yeah, he, he probably wants to sell you uh, some insurance for your car. That's what he usually does, and I haven't had a car since I moved to New York. Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I'm excited to welcome guest Bjana Stolstrup, the original designer and implementer of the C++ programming language. I'm also excited to welcome co-host James Murphy, who runs the M Coding YouTube channel, where he discusses Python, C++, and more. And unlike usual for my interviews, I'm going to skip doing a demo of the language since I've already done several videos demoing C++ 20 features. But like my usual interviews, I've edited the recording after the fact and chosen visuals to accompany the discussion. Let's get started. So could you please introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, I'm Janis Holstrup. I'm the designer and original implementer of C++ and been working on it for quite a while. And we got a new international standard last year that I worked on also, C++ 20. And I'm sitting in New York City on Manhattan and talking to you from there. Up in a high rise? Um, not very, but there's a nice view out over the Hudson River. That sounds great. Okay, so you get a lot of the same questions, I'm sure a lot, but I think it's useful to ask a question of, you know, in terms of how C++ got started, you uh, attribute some of the design process of the classes, at least in part, to things like Simula. So why did you choose, say, not to use Simula directly when you started C++ and so on? Oh, yes. Let's see. I was a, a young researcher, just arrived at Bell Labs, and I realized by looking at what people have been doing there that I was among people who had done spectacular things, so I'd better do something good. Uh, I had to raise my uh, ambition level. So I decided to build what would have become the first Unix cluster or the first uh, major multiprocessor Unix, and decided very quickly that I couldn't do that because I didn't have the right tools. And the tools I needed was a low-level language to manipulate hardware and gain efficiency at low-level stuff. And I needed a high-level language to allow me to express things like which is a part of a system that runs over here as opposed to the one that runs over there. And how do they communicate? What are the communication protocols? Because if you can't assume that they're in the same place, you can't do all the usual horrible stuff with messing with memory and such. I was on the corridor with Brian Kernighan and Dennis Ritchie, so it was obvious to use C. It was one of several languages that could do it, but the local support was superb. And then I needed a higher level language and I had good experience with Simula. I've been taught that by uh, actually Christian Nugor. I knew him personally. And it had the class concept with member functions and such that I needed. The problem was it was far, far too slow. And uh, of course, my first idea was, why don't I just make it faster? But then I came to my senses and realized that the people who had built it were rather smart people. And uh, for me to re-implement it to get the efficiency 10, 50 times faster than uh, what was available was a very unlikely event. And so instead, I took the concepts and built them as I best could into C, where the efficiency was there. And it was pretty obvious how to get a simple class concept into C so that it ran at the kind of speeds that we're used to for C. And also, I didn't have the garbage connector, uh, which was in Simula. And that meant that I could do my uh, device drivers and process schedulers and uh, such that was absolutely essential. I, I just could not have managed with a garbage collector for that kind of application. And furthermore, garbage collector is a centralized resource and I wanted to build a distributed system. So there was two reasons. There was the performance and the garbage collector. Awesome. 
And not directly related to garbage collection, but sort of tangential is the issue of the resource acquisition is initialization. And my understanding is you had that as an important early feature in C++. Oh, very. Um, this is the kind of thing that um, I had in the first week or two. And basically, it was not just memory management. It was, I, I came out of a, a world with operating systems and machine architectures, and there are resources, not just memory, but also communication channels, processes, things like that. And I needed code scenes very badly early, uh, fairly early on. So I knew I had to start up something that required resources. And then later I had to clean up the mess that they had built. And so it seems absolutely obvious that there should be a notion of creating an object, which became constructors. And there has to be the inverse operation that pulls down the execution environment. And so the early version says that the constructor builds up the execution environment and the destructor uh, cleans up after it. Um, that was the idea. They were not called constructors and destructors till um, a year later, but that's what my note says, resources creating execution environment. I mean, I was a systems guy and you need to manage resources. It's, it is not optional. Yeah, that makes sense. You may be curious about something. In early Unix days, there's a notion sometimes that processes, everything should be its own process. And the process sort of cleans itself up automatically, you know, at the Unix level and so on. What was your motivation to work at a sub-process level rather than at the process level? Well, processes were relatively big and relatively slow. The P2P 1170 that I shared with 40 other researchers gave me a uh, 256k worth of memory to operate with and i was dreaming in the future i could get a whole megabyte and i could get a whole megahertz for the processor so i was trying to think forward but it was clear to me that the kind of relatively small unit should be a module that i needed a fair number of couldn't be processes with that resource level and so I worked on cold scenes, which was the cheapest form of that, much cheaper than, say, threads, and very much cheaper than processes. Processes are much better if you can get them, but they were not an option. And if I use processes, of course, I would have to design some mechanism for the processes to communicate in a reasonable type-safe manner or a byte stream. Uh, this can be done, but, well, I didn't know how to do it at the time. Okay, good enough. Now, of course, C++ is a very complicated language right now. You can do a lot of different paradigms, which is why I find the C++ core guidelines very fascinating. I find that it simplifies and focuses a view of the language. I'm curious how the community views that as a whole, and also what's the state of automated verification of compliance to C++ core guidelines? This is a very important topic, as, as you know, if you've been listening to my talks. As I said, I talk for years till I convince people and then things happen. The core guidelines came along because I realized that you cannot simplify the language. If you make a small incompatible change, you can annoy a couple of hundred thousand people. If you make a significant change, that is something that really makes a difference to the user community, you will annoy, say, a million people, and it will not happen because the implementers will be forced to have compatibility switches that are set default to do it the old way. We try to deprecate features. We try to get rid of old features we knew were mostly doing harm, and we failed every single time. Nah, maybe one or two little details, uh, mostly at the level where you don't see it. But little things like changing the definition of the string type caused 10 years of grief to the GCC guys. Um, we have to be careful there. So my conclusion was that we can't do anything significant in terms of removing old features. So we can't simplify the language. And people always want more features and more advanced features. So the language will grow. However, you can simplify the use of the language. That is, you don't have to use that old stuff except in the old code you mustn't break. So 
why don't we make a set of rules for what we think modern C++ is? Not defining it as a C++ 17 or C++ 20, but an evolving set of rules that says, well, there's now a better feature, there's a better way of doing this, so try doing this. So if you're going through a whole user range for only if you want to fiddle with the details and looking at the loop variables, do you use the old stuff? And so I started building something for that, writing up and talking to people about enforcement. And then I realized I wasn't the only one doing it. And so some of us joined up and that's how we got the core guidelines, which you can go on the web and find. Type in core guidelines or GitHub and you'll find the whole stuff. And if you don't like them, make some contributions, suggest improvements. And even if you do like them, suggest improvements and additions. And one thing that I knew a long time ago is everybody hates coding guidelines because they invariably tell you that certain things you do, you shouldn't. The other thing is that at scale, you can't follow them. So uh, a lot of sets of guidelines has 100 or 200 rules. You can't remember them. You're looking at a million lines of code. You can't keep them in your head. The core guidelines have more rules than that. Uh, you, you, you just can't scale it to a million lines of code without help. So part of the idea from day one was we need static analyzers to tell us when we break the rules. We were not there yet. We're getting there. So my idea is you write a piece of code, you know sort of the philosophy of the core guidelines, you know some of the major ones, but you inevitably screw up somewhere. And you run the static analyzer and it tells you, you violated this rule there. And here's a link to the rule. And all the rules are on the format. They have a name, they have a rationale, they have an example of the bad things that can happen to you if you violate it. And it has an alternative that you might like to try. And we're getting close to that. The, the Microsoft Visual Studio static checker checks a lot of that. You can get memory safety out of that, for instance. And Plank Tidy are working on that. They're not quite as far ahead, but they're coming. It's also hard to check rules because they can be too tight. The rules are sometimes do this unless there's a problem. And static checkers are not particularly good at that. So there's work to be done. Uh, you don't want too many false positives, and, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. But this is something that happens. And this is something that I started six, seven years ago. And give it another two or three years. And I think it'll be part of just about everybody's tool chain. What is missing is a static checker that's independent of any implementation. The Clang one is nice, the Microsoft one is nice, but they're not the same. And I can't use them on my GCC code bases. Then I'll have to move them over to the other environment and run it there and move it back. That's, that's just too complicated for something that's supposed to make life simpler. But it's very important. We can't simplify the language, but we can simplify the use of the language, but we need help to do that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so I'm really interested in the future of C++ and what that holds. So I've been watching a lot of your like CppCon lectures and things like that. And even back in say like 2014, you're already talking about things like concepts and modules and ranges, which are only now being implemented in C20 and in 23. So my question is, for today, what are those things that you're thinking about for you know, C32? And that's it for my video. I hope you liked it. And if so, make sure to subscribe. And for the answer to that last question about upcoming C++ features, and for the rest of the interview, go over to Encoding using the provided link.